सेवन सिविलाइजिंग द नेटिव एडुकेटिंग द नेशन इन द अर्लियर चैप्टर्स यू हैव सीन हाउ ब्रिटिश रूल अफेक्टेड राजस एंड नवाब पिजेंट्स एंड ट्राइबल्स इन दिस चैप्टर वी विल ट्राई एंड अंडरस्टैंड वट इम्प्लीकेशन इट हैड फॉर द लाइफ ऑफ स्टूडेंट For the British in India wanted not only territorial conquest and control over revenues, they also felt that uh, they had a cultural mission. They had to civilize the natives, change their customs and values. What changes were to be introduced? How were Indians to be educated, civilized, and made into what the British believed were good subjects? The British could find no simple answers to these questions. They continued to be de uh, debated for many decades. Linguistic: Some who knows and studies several languages. How the British saw education? Let us look at what the British thought uh, and did, and how some of the ideas of education that we now take for granted evolved in the last 200 years. In the process of this inquiry, we will uh, also see how Indians reacted to British ideas and how they developed uh, their own views about how Indians were to be educated. The tradition of uh, Orientalisms. Figure. William Jones learning Persian In 1783 a person named William Jones arrived in Calcutta he had an appointment as a junior judge at the supreme court that the company had set up in addition to being an expert in law jones was a linguist he had studied greek and latin at oxford knew french and english had picked up arabic from a friend and had also learned persian At Calcutta he began spending many hours a day with pandits who taught him the subtleties of Sanskrit language grammar and poetry soon he was studying ancient indian text on law philosophy re religion politics morality arithmetic medicine and the other sciences Jones discovered that his interest was shared by many British officials living in Calcutta at the time. Englishmen like Henry Thomas Colebrook and Nathaniel Halhert were also busy discovering the ancient Indian heritage, mastering Indian languages, and translating Sanskrit and Persian works into English. Together with them, Jones set up the Asiatic Society of Bengal and started a journal called. Asiatic researches Henry Thomas Colebrook figure he was a scholar of Sanskrit and ancient sacred writings of Hinduism Jones and Colebrook came to represent a particular attitude towards India they shared a deep respect for ancient cultures both of India and the west indian civilization they felt had attained its its glory in the ancient past but had subsequently declined in order to understand india it was necessary to discover the sacred and legal texts that were produced in the ancient period for though only those texts could reveal the real ideas and laws of the hindus and muslims and only a new study of this text could form the basis of future development in india so jones and colebrook went about discovering ancient texts understanding their meaning translating them and making their finding known to others this project they believed would not only help the british learn from indian culture but it would also help indians rediscover their own heritage and understand the lost glories of their past in this process the british would become the guardians of indian culture as well as its masters Influenced by such ideas many company officials argued that the british ought to promote indian rather than western learning they felt that institutions should be set up to encourage the study of ancient indian texts and teach sanskrit and persian literature and poetry the officials also thought that hindus and muslims ought to be taught uh, what they were already familiar with and 
what they valued and treasured, not subjects that were alien to them. Only then they believed could the British hope to win a place in the hearts of the natives. Only then could the alien rulers expect to be respected by their subjects. With the object in view, a madrasa was set up in Calcutta in 1781 to promote the study of Arabic, Persian and Islamic law. And the Hindu college was established in Benaras in 1791 to encourage the study of ancient Sanskrit texts that would be useful for the administration of the country. Madrasa, an Arabic word for a place of learning any type of school or college. Figure Monument of Warren Hastings by Richard, Richard Westmacott, 1830, now in Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. This image represents how Orientalists thought of British power in India. You will notice that the majestic figure of Hastings, an enthusiastic supporter of the Orientalist, is placed between the standing figure of a Pandit on one side and a seated Munsi on the other side. Hastings and other Orientalists need Indian scholars to teach them the vernacular languages tell them about local customs and, and laws, and help them translate and interpret ancient text. Hastings took the initiative to set up the Calcutta Madrasa and believed that the ancient customs of the country and oriental learning ought to be the basis of British rule in India. Not all officials shared these views. Many were very strong in their criticisms of the Orientalist. Grave Errors of the East From the early 19th century, many British officials began to criticize the Orientalist vision of learning. They said that knowledge of the East was full of errors and unscientific thought. Eastern literature was non-serious and light-hearted. So they argued that it was wrong on the part of the British to spend so much effort in encouraging the study of Arabic and Sanskrit language and literature. James Mill was one of those who attacked the Orientalist. The British effort, he declared, should not be to teach what the natives wanted or what they respected in order to please them and win a place in their heart. The aim of education ought to be to teach what was useful and practical, so Indians should be made familiar with the scientific and technical advances that the West had made rather than with the poetry and sacred literature of the Orient. Orientalist, those with a scholarly knowledge of the language and culture of Asia. Munshi, a person who can read, write and teach Persian. Vernacular, a term generally used to refer to a local language or dialect as distinct from what is seen as the standard language. In colonial countries like India, the British used the term to mark the difference between the local languages of everyday use and English, the language of the imperial masters. By the 1830s, the attack on the Orientalists became sharper. One of the most outspoken and influential of such critics of the time was Thomas Babington Macaulay. He saw India as an uncivilized country that needed to be civilized. No branch of Eastern knowledge, according to him, could be compared to what England had produced. Who could deny, declared Macaulay, that a single self of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. He asked that the British government in India stop wasting public money in promoting Oriental learning for it was of no practical use. With great energy and passion, Macaulay emphasized the need to teach the English language. He felt that knowledge of English would allow Indians to read some of the finest literature the world had produced. It would make them aware of the developments in Western science and philosophy. Teaching of English could thus be a way of civilizing people, changing their tastes, values and cultures. Figure Thomas Babington Macaulay in his study.
following McLeod's mandate, the English Education Act of 1835 was introduced. The decision was to make English the medium of instruction for higher education and to stop the promotion of Oriental institutions like the Calcutta Madrasa and Benaros Sanskrit College. These institutions were seen as temple of darkness that were falling of themselves into decay. English textbooks now began to be produced for schools. Source 1. Language of Wife Emphasizing the need to teach English, McCloy declared all parties seem to be agreed on one point that the dialects commonly spoken among the natives of India contain neither literary nor scientific information and are moreover so poor and rude that until they are enriched from some other quarters, it will not be easy to translate any valuable work into them. From Thomas Babington Macaulay, Minute of 2 February 1835 on Indian Education. Education for Commerce in 1854, the Court of Directors of the East India Company in London sent an educational dispatch to the Governor General in India, issued by Charles Wood, the President of the Board of Control of the Company. It has come to be known as Wood's Dispatch, outlining the educational policy that was to be followed in India. It emphasized once again the practical benefits of a system of European learning as opposed to Oriental knowledge. One of the practical uses the dispatch pointed to was economic. European learning, it said, would enable Indians to recognize the advantages that flow from the expansion of trade and commerce and make them see the importance of developing the resources of the country. Introducing them to European ways of life would change their tastes and desires and create a demand for British goods. For Indians would begin to appreciate and buy things that were produced in Europe. Wood's dispatch also argued that European learning would improve the moral character of Indians. It would make them truthful and honest and thus supply the company with civil servants who could be trusted and dependent upon. The literature of the East was not only full of grave errors, it could also not instill in people a sense of duty and a commitment to work, nor could it develop the skills required for administration. Following the 1854 dispatch, several measures were introduced by the British. Education departments of the government were set up to extend control over all matters regarding education. Steps were taken to establish a system of university education. In 1857, while the sepoys rose in revolt in Meerut and Delhi, universities were being established in Calcutta, Madras and Bombay. Attempts were also made to bring about changes within the system of school education. Activity Imagine you are living in the 1850s, you hear of Wood's dispatch. Write about your reactions. Comment this. Source 2. An argument for European knowledge. Wood's dispatch of 1854 marked the final triumph of those who opposed Oriental learning, it stated. We must emphatically declare that the education which we desire to see extended in India is that which has for its object the diffusion of the improved art, arts, services, philosophy and literature of Europe, in short, European knowledge. Figure Bombay University in the 19th century The demand for moral education the argument for practical education was strongly criticized by the criti Christian missionaries in India in the 19th century. The missionaries felt that education should attempt to improve the moral character of the people and morality could be improved only through Christian education. Until 1813, the East India Company was opposed to missionary activities in India. It feared that missionary activities would provoke reaction among the local population and make them suspicious of British presence in India. 
Unable to establish an institution within British controlled territories, the missionaries set up a mission at Sirampur in an area under the control of the Danish East India Company. A printing press was set up in 1800 and a college established in 1818. Over the 19th century, missionary schools were set up all over India. After 1857, however, the British government in India was reluctant to directly support missionary education. There was a feeling that any strong attack on local customs, practice, beliefs, and religious ideas might enlarge, enrage native opinion. Figure William Carey was a Scottish missionary who helped establish the Sirampur mission. Figure Sirampur College on the banks of the river Hooghly near Calcutta. What happened to the local schools? Do you have any idea of how children were taught in pre-British times? Have you ever wondered whether they went to schools? And if there were schools, what happened to this under British rule? Figure A village, Patshala. This is a painting by a Dutch painter, Franco Solvin, who came to India in the late 18th century. He tried to depict the everyday life of people in his paintings. The report of William Adam. In the 1830s, the William Adam, a Scottish missionary, toured the district of Bengal and Bihar. He had been asked by the company to report on the progress of education in vernacular schools. The report Adam produced in interesting. Adam found that there were over 1 lakh partialas in Bengal and Bihar. These were small institutions with no more than 20 students each. But the total number of children being taught in these partialas were considerable, over 20 lakh. These institutions were set up by wealthy people or the local community. At times, they were started by a teacher, Guru. The system of education was flexible. Few things that you associate with schools today were present in the Patshalas at the time. There were no fixed fee, no printed books, no separate school building, no benches or chairs, no blackboards, no system of separate classes, no roll call register, no annual examination, and no regular timetable. In some places, classes were held under a banyan tree, and in other places, in the corner of a village shop or temple or at the guru's home. Fee dependent on the income of parents, the rich had to pay more than the poor, teaching was oral, and the guru decided what to teach, in accordance with the needs of the students. Students were not separated out into different classes. All of them sat together in one place. The guru interacted separately with groups of children with different levels of learning. Adam discovered that this, this flexible system was suited to local needs. For instance, classes were not held during harvest time when rural children often worked in the fields. The Patshala started once again when the crops had been cut and stored. This meant that even children of peasant families could study. Activity 1. Imagine you were born in a poor family in the 1850s. How would you have responded to the coming of the new system of government? regulated Patsalas. 2. Did you know that about 50% of the children going to primary school drop out of school by the time they are 13 or 14? Can you think of the various possible reasons for this fact? Comment this. New Routines, New Rules Up to the mid-19th century, the company was concerned primary, primarily with higher education. So it allowed the local parcelas to function without much interference. After 1854, the company decided to improve the system of vernacular education. It felt that this could be done by introducing order within the system imposing routines, establishing rules, ensuring regular inspections. How was this to be done? What measures did the company undertake? It appointed a number of government pundits, each in charge of looking after four to five schools. The task of the pundit was to visit the Patsalas and try and improve the standard of teaching. 
Each guru was asked to submit periodic reports and take classes according to a regular timetable. Teaching was now to be based on textbooks and learning was to be tested through a system of annual examination. The students were asked to pay a regular fee, attend regular classes, sit on fixed seats and obey the new rules of discipline. Patsalas which accepted the new rules were supported through government grants. Those who were unwilling to work within the new system received no government support. Over time, gurus who wanted to retain their independence found it difficult to compete with the government-aided and regulated patsalas. The new rules and routines had another consequences. In the earlier system, children from poor peasant families had been able to go to patsalas. Since the timetable was flexible, the discipline of the new system demanded regular attendance. Even during harvest time, when children of poor families had to work in the fields, inability to attend school came to be seen as indiscipline. As evidence of the lack of desire to learn, figure Sri Aurobindo Ghosh, in speech delivered on January 15, 1908 in Bombay, Aurobindo Ghosh stated that the goal of national education was to awaken the spirit of nationality among the students. This required a contemplation of the heroic deeds of our ancestors. The education should be imparted in the vernacular so as to reach the largest number of people. Aurobindo Ghosh emphasized that although the students should remain connected to their own roots, they should also take the fullest advantage of modern scientific discoveries and Western experiments in popular governments. Moreover, the students should also learn some useful crafts so that they could be able to find some moderately remunerative employment after leaving their schools. The Agenda for a National Education British officials were not the only people thinking about education in India. From the early 19th century, many thinkers from different parts of India began to talk of the need for a wider spread of education. Impressed with the developments in Europe, some Indians felt that Western education would help modernize India. They asked the British to open more schools, colleges and universities and spend more money on education. You will read about some of these efforts in Chapter 9. There were other Indians, however, who reacted against Western education. Mahatma Gandhi and Rabindranath Tagore were two such individuals. Let us look at what they had to say. English education has enslaved us. Mahatma Gandhi argued that colonial education created a sense of inferiority in the minds of Indians. It made them see Western civilization as superior and destroyed the pride they had in their own culture. There was poison in this education, said Mahatma Gandhi. It was sinful. It enslaved Indians. It cast an evil spell on them, charmed by the West, appreciating everything that came from the West. Indians educated in these institutions began admiring British rule. Mahatma Gandhi wanted an education that could help Indians recover their sense of dignity and self-respect. During the national movement, he asked students to leave educational institutions in order to show to the British that Indians were no longer willing to be enslaved. Mahatma Gandhi strongly felt that Indian languages ought to be the medium of teaching education in English crippled Indians, distanced them from their own social surroundings, and made them strangers in their own lands. Speaking a foreign tongue, despising local culture, the English educated did not know how to relate to the masses. Western education, Mahatma Gandhi said, focused on reading and writing rather than oral language knowledge. It valued textbooks rather than lived experience and practical knowledge. He argued that education ought to develop a person's mind and soul. Literacy or simply learning to read and write by itself did not count as education. People had to work with their hands, learn a craft and know how different things operated. This would develop their mind and their capacity to understand. Figure Mahatma Gandhi along with 
Kasturba Gandhi sitting with Rabindranath Tagore and a group of guards at Shantini Ketan, 1940. Source 3. Literacy in itself is not education. Mahatma Gandhi wrote, By education I mean an all-round drawing out of the best in child and man, body, mind, spirit. Literacy is not the end of education, not even the beginning. It is only one of the means whereby man and woman can be educated. Literacy in itself is not education. I would therefore begin the child's education by teaching it a useful handicraft and enabling it to produce from the moment it begins its training. I hold that the highest development of the mind and soul is possible under such a system of education. Only every handicraft has to be taught not merely machine mechanically as, as is done today but scientifically. That is, the child, child should know the why and the wherefore of every process. The Collected Works of Mahatma Gandhi, Volume 72, page 79. Its nationalist sentiment spread. Other thinkers also began thinking of a system of national education which would be radically different from that set up by the British. Tagore's Abode of Peace figure a class in progress in Santhanikathan in the 1930s. Notice the surrounding, the trees and the open spaces. Many of you may have heard of Santhanikathan. Do you know why it was established and by whom? Rabindranath Tagore started the institution in 1901. As a child, Tagore hated going to school. He found it suffocating and oppressive. The school appeared like a prison, for he could never do what he felt like doing. So while other children listened to the teacher, Tagore's mind would wander away. The, spree, the experience of his school days in Calcutta shaped Tagore's ideas of education. On growing up, he wanted to set up a school where the child was happy, where she could be free and creative, where she was able to explore her own thoughts and desires. Tagore felt the childhood ought to be a time of self-learning outside the rigid and restricting disciplines of the schooling system set up by the British. Teachers had to be imaginative, understand the child and help the child develop her curiosity. According to Tagore, the existing schools killed a natural desire of the child to be creative, her sense of wonder. Tagore was of the view that creative learning could be encouraged only within a natural environment. So he chose to set up his school 100 kilometers away from Calcutta in a rural setting. He saw it as an abode of peace, Santi Niketan. While living in harmony with nature, children could cultivate, it, cultivate their natural creativity. In many senses, Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi thought about education in similar ways. There were, however, differences too. Gandhiji was highly critical of Western civilization and its worship of machines and technology. Tagore wanted to combine elements of modern Western civilization with what he saw as the best within Indian tradition. He emphasized the need to teach science and technology at Santini Ketan, along with art, music and dance. Many individuals and thinkers were thus thinking about the way a national educational system could be fashioned. Some wanted changes within the system set up by the British and felt that the system could be extended so as to include wider section of people. Others asked that alternative system be created so that people were educated into a culture that was truly national. Who was to define what was truly national? The debate about what is what this national education ought to be continued till after independence. Figure children playing in the missionary school in Coimbatore, early 20th century. By the mid 19th century, schools for girls were being set up by Christian missionaries and Indian reforms organizations. Elsewhere, education as a civilizing mission. Until the introduction of the Education Act in 1870, 
there was no widespread education for the population as a whole for most of the 19th century. Child labor being widely prevalent, poor children could not be sent to school for their earning was critical for the survival of the family. The number of school was also limited to those run by the church or set up by wealthy individuals. It was only after the coming into force of the Education Act that schools were opened by the government and compulsory schooling was introduced. One of the most important educational thinkers of the period as Thomas Arnold, who became the headmaster of the private school rugby. Favoring a secondary school curriculum which had a detailed study of the Greek, Greek and Roman classics, written 2000 years earlier, he said, it has always seemed to me one of the great advantages of the course of study generally pursued in our English schools that it draws our minds so continually to dwell upon the past. Every day we are engaged in studying the languages, the history and the thoughts of men who lived nearly, nearly or more than 2000 years ago. Arnold felt that a study of the classics disciplined the mind. In fact, most educators of the time believed that such a discipline was necessary because young people were naturally savage and needed to be controlled. To become civilized adults, they needed to understand society's notion of right and wrong. Proper and improper behavior, education, especially one which disciplined their minds, was made to guide them on this path. Can you suggest how such ideas might have influenced thinking about education of the poor in England and of the natives in the colonies? Comment this. Let's imagine. Imagine you were witness to a debate between Mahatma Gandhi and Macloy on English education. Write a page on the dialogue you heard. Comment this. Let's recall. Let's discuss, let's do. Do this and comment this.